Let's pray together. Father, we do seek to walk by faith. We know that our home is in heaven, our citizenship is in heaven. One day we will see face to face. One day we will even be like your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as far as it's possible for us finite humans to resemble the second person of the Trinity. We long for that day when the race is done, when the battle is won, and when we are forever in your presence, experiencing the infinite increase of delight with no end. Lord, we, we pray for help this morning. As we walk by faith, we look to your word, our anchor, our rock, our help. And we pray that by your Holy Spirit this morning, we would see things in your word that we need, that we would hear things from you this morning that we need today. Would you be pleased to work in us, to root out idolatries, to secure faith, even to this very day, bring someone to yourself who needs eternal life. We ask all these things by your supernatural power, by the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As you're taking your seats, take out your Bibles and turn to the last book and the 14th chapter. We're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Revelation. And we'll be looking this morning at verses 6 through 13. It was in 1987 that the band R.E.M. put out its hit, It's the End of the World as We Know It, and I Feel Fine. I considered having Chris, in fact, I asked the band this morning if they would lead us in this anthem from my youth, <laughs> but there are a couple things wrong with the theology of the song. The first obvious error is that the world did not end in 1987. And secondly, importantly, I don't believe Michael Stipe was ready in 1987 for the world to end. He was terribly, terribly wrong in feeling fine about it. While the world as we know it did not end in 1987, it certainly will do so. When? We do not know. There is no countdown clock, at least not visible to us. How much time is left in the game? You know, in sports, the clock is helpful. You know the clock, you see the clock, you calculate what it takes to maintain a lead or to come from behind. You manage the clock, milk the clock, maybe you beat the clock. But God's clock for this world is unmanageable. It is unbeatable. Time will run out. And will the world be ready? Will you be fine? In Revelation 14, we will see a series of announcements from heaven that will be made in the closing moments of this age designed to prepare the world for what happens at the end of the world. Let's read together our text, Revelation 14, beginning in verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in mid heaven, having an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who inhabit the earth, and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory. Because the hour of his judgment has come, worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. And another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her sexual immorality. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his rage, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. 
Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. We have in this text four announcements preparing the world and your heart for the end. In chapter 14 of Revelation, there is a series of six angels, a voice from heaven, an appearance of Jesus, and an audible message from the Holy Spirit. All of these are designed to prepare the world for the end. This morning, looking at verses 6 to 13, we will pay our attention to the first three angels and an announcement from God. Four announcements this morning to prepare the world for the end. The first announcement is gospel proclaimed. Gospel proclaimed. Look at verse 6. And I saw, I saw another angel flying in mid heaven, having an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who inhabit the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. John says here, and I saw, it introduces to us a new scene, and in this new scene is another angel, another of the same kind of angels we've seen before in the book. And this angel is flying in mid-heaven. Mid-heaven is the apex of the sun's arc at midday from the vantage point of someone on the earth, the, the high point of the sun. And so this angel flying in the sky is elevated so as to be seen and so as to be heard. And his audience is a global audience. The text tells us this angel has everlasting gospel to proclaim. Literally, it is having everlasting gospel to gospelize. Having eternal evangel to evangelize. And in the original text, it does not say the gospel. It does not say a gospel either. It should just be read gospel. That is, good news. You look down at verse 6. I saw this angel flying in mid-heaven having eternal gospel to proclaim, to gospelize. What does gospel mean? The word gospel simply means good news. This angel has good news to declare to the world. What is this good news in the midst of the great tribulation, the world's darkest hour? We most readily think when we hear the word gospel, of substitutionary atonement. The death of Jesus in the place of sinners, which, if believed, provides salvation and eternal life. And that's appropriate. That is a a technical use of the word gospel, though that is not the way the word gospel is used in every context. The word gospel, as good news, is employed to convey several aspects of God's message of good news to a bad humanity. In Mark 1, we read the gospel of God. In in Mark 1, 1, the gospel of Christ. Acts 20 describes the gospel of grace. Ephesians 1 describes the gospel of salvation. In Luke 2, we have the gospel or good news of the incarnation. Good news, glad tidings of a baby to be born who is Savior. In Matthew 4, we have the gospel of the kingdom of Christ. The good news of Messiah's coming is world peace and a righteous rule over the nations. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, we have the gospel of the glory of Christ. Good news there located in the vindication of Jesus as the glorious second person of the Trinity. The gospel is used to describe not only Messiah's first coming but also Messiah's substitutionary death and resurrection and his second coming and his glory and his salvation of sinners and his final vindication. The gospel is used to describe the good news of Jesus, his person and his work through and through. And this angel flying in mid heaven is heralding what is called timeless gospel, eternal gospel, everlasting good news. The salvation of Christ, the wrapping up of evil, the golden age of the kingdom of Jesus arriving, the vindication of God's honor, all of it, I believe, is wrapped up in this proclamation of timeless good news. And notice the audience of this proclamation. 
We have two descriptions here in verse 6. Those who inhabit the earth and every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Those who inhabit the earth is different than the phrase we become accustomed to in the book of Revelation, the earth dwellers. It is a different word here. Earth dwellers is a technical term for those who are in rebellion against God and their unbelief. It's significant that in this verse, John employs a different word altogether. He simply means those who are there, those who inhabit the globe. That gives us an optimistic response to the effects of this proclamation on this audience. They are not those described by God as those locked into rebellion against God. But here at the world's darkest point in the last hour is a gracious proclamation of good news available to those who happen to inhabit the earth. It's very interesting language. And notice they are also described as every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. That is the the same swath of the kinds of people who will inhabit heaven. Surrounding the throne of the Lamb are people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. In other words, God will not give up until earth's last hour on his mission to rescue people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people and secure their eternity around the glory of his Son. God will finish this. This is a global audience, and this angel in mid-heaven is a loud, clear herald of warning and mercy in this rebellious world's final hour. This gospelizer, flying in mid-heaven, is untouchable. The beasts are on the earth, first beast, second beast, Antichrist and the false prophet, And at this point in the future, even Satan and his demon hordes no longer have access to heavens or the heavenlies. They are confined to the earth only. But this angel hovers in mid-sky. He cannot be silenced. He cannot be censored. The Antichrist can murder the two witnesses, martyr the evangelists on the earth, harass and imprison the saints, but he can't cancel the angel flying in mid-heaven. God is sure to make his word heard. And this angel has something to say. Notice the message in verse 7. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. Fear God. This is just the message Jesus gave in Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I want you to think about fear for a moment, particularly in this era of future world history, the time of the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation will be a time of nightmarish terror and abject fear. The world will be enslaved to the most brutal tyrant of history, Humanity will be ensconced in the darkest cloud of unrestrained depravity. There will be terrors from the heavens. There will be no love on the earth. It will be a time of fear as the world has never known. And the message from the angel in mid-heaven is, fear God. Fear God. It is a command to reorient your loyalties. Recalibrate your thinking. Uh, There's something entirely different you need to be afraid of right now, and it is God. Stop fearing the loss of life, the loss of pleasures, the loss of your idols. Stop fearing starvation, enslavement, poverty, and disasters. Start fearing God. That is the message. And then he says, give God glory. This is a command to repent, to do a 180 degree turn, to reorient your worship. And this gets at the fundamental problem of humanity. We are born misappropriating glory. We are glory robbers. That is, we take glory to ourselves that rightly belongs to God. We are glory exchangers. We transfer glory to creatures that rightly belongs to God. And we are glory suppressors. We stuff the revealed glory of God under any lie we can fabricate so that we can pretend we are unaccountable to the one who made us and will judge us. This angel's command is to flip loyalties, switch teams, to flip the fundamental commitment of our lives, give glory to God. 
and change everything about yourself. And then the reason is given in this message, because the hour of his judgment has come. Hour here is a, a reference to a fixed moment. That's different than talking about an opportune time or an appropriate season. No, this is it. The clock has run out. It's now. The judgment of the rebellious world has finally come. In fact, the next event in Revelation is the beginning of the pouring out of the bold judgments in chapter 15. They come in rapid fire, a final salvo of divine cataclysms just prior to the physical return of the King of Kings to the earth. These are the final seconds of human history in this age. And the angel commands the global audience, worship him. Worship him who made everything. The heaven, the earth, the sea, the springs of waters. Heaven, the earth is a merism. That is, it, it takes the farthest reaches of everything and the things right here close to you and everything in between. God made everything A to Z, from the heavens to the earth. And he made the springs of water. And in the terrible cataclysms that have come upon the earth, everybody's drinking water has been affected. Water for crops, the waters of the seas, they've all been damaged. What is this angel flying in midheaven saying? The one in charge of all of these things is the one graciously appealing to you right now to get your attention, to repent. To believe the gospel. To switch your loyalties. And to say that you need to worship him who made everything. Is to recognize that your maker is your judge. You didn't pick who made you. And you don't get to pick who will assess your life. You may think that you get to be the arbiter of your life. Well lived or poorly lived at the end. Let me show you what I've done. You don't get to be the judge. You may think that your fans and your friends get to decide for you your eternity. You may assume that some man-made religious system can tell you where you will end up. Not so. Your maker is your judge. Graciously here, he gives this warning. This is the last chance. Don't wait, says the angel. Listen, there's a, there's a message for us in this warning today. You might be tempted to think right now, hey, I see this in the book of the Revelation. That's future world history. When the time comes, I'll recognize the signs. And then for sure, okay, yep, dad was right. Uh, I will realign my life then. You need to know it doesn't work that way. If you stiff arm God now, you are putting calluses on your heart that do not allow you to be soft later. In addition to that, the Bible talks about judicial hardening, that God gives you over to the hard heart you desire. I'm convinced it's not the people that sat in churches and rejected God who will turn to Christ in the last days. God will be faithful to get the gospel out, published to every people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people. But there is no safety in hearing the truth now and rejecting it. Only danger. This warning of an angel flying in mid-heaven, warning the last generation of humans of this age, was written in this book and is being preached to you now so that you don't make this mistake. Don't wait, but turn Listen, most won't believe even then. Noah preached to a rebellious world, and how many people got on the boat? Only eight. In an era where two witnesses will be killed publicly, violently, for speaking the truth. When 144,000 Jewish evangelists will be supernaturally protected to take the gospel all across the earth. But the rest of the saints will be oppressed and beaten down and many of them martyred. Think about evangelism now. How hard is it for you to talk to your neighbor across the street? A coworker in the next cubicle? Your friends at school or on sports teams? 
We have freedom and opportunity now to publish the gospel. We need to preach the gospel now. There's a second announcement in this text to prepare the world and prepare our own hearts. Babylon fallen. Babylon fallen. Notice verse 8. Another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her sexual immorality. We read that a second angel follows. This is a second after the other angel we just read about. Second in this immediate series. And he follows. The implication there is that this angel ends up in the same location, flying in mid-heaven, with the same audience, every tongue, tribe, nation, and people, with a second announcement. And his announcement concerns Babylon. This is the first time we hear about Babylon in the book of Revelation. We'll get more details in chapters 17 and 18. But for now, you need to know Babylon refers in this book to a literal city on the Euphrates River, rebuilt as the capital of the world's end-time rebellion. It was, in fact, the capital city of the world's first unified rebellion against God, built by Nimrod in Genesis 10.9. Chapter later in, in Genesis 11, we read of the tower that was built. You've heard of the Tower of Babel, same place, same city. A city marked by idolatry, rebellion, the greatness of man's accomplishments without God, a one-world ambition, and anti-God purpose. What did they say? They, they built this tower, probably a ziggurat. Uh, think the Egyptian pyramids and the, and the pyramids in the, the Mexican peninsula. In fact, these same shapes show up everywhere around the world post-flood. Wonder where they got the idea. Pagan idolatry, sexual immorality, tied together in a political religious system, trying to make the most out of man without God, and we will reach the heavens. That's the Tower of Babel. That's the end times Babylon, and that's the spirit of Babylon every place in between in human history. The Babylonian Empire followed in the days of Daniel. In fact, in Daniel 4.30, Nebuchadnezzar called his city Babylon the Great. Same refrain that we have here. In fact, that's the way it's referred to every time in the book of Revelation. Babylon the Great. This, this idea is being resurrected in the end times. The old Babylon was an ambitious empire gobbling up other empires. It was the enemy of God's people, the destroyer of Jerusalem. It oppressed the saints. It was committed to idolatry in rebellion against God. And the last Babylon will be the same. The end times Babylon, with its capital again on the Euphrates River, will be the hub of a political and religious system of rebellion against God in the world's last hour. And listen to this angel's announcement concerning Babylon. Fallen, fallen. Literally, it fell, it fell, Babylon the Great. Past tense verbs, which are a guarantee of a future reality. Which is really a stunning promise. The mightiest empire the world will ever have known. The, the resurrection of Babylonian religious and political evil combined with a revival of Roman military might on a global scale dominating every nation, every tongue, every tribe, and every people on the earth. No one could stop it. But God. This is good news. That world system is judged. Fallen, fallen, says the angel. It means that it is no more. In fact, demolished after a very short lifespan, crushed by God. It means that the world did not repent and believe. It means that the world at the end does not improve. The world does not become more of a welcoming place for Jesus when he arrives. God had to smash it. Just as God came down to smash the puny tower at Babel 4,000 years ago. And notice how Babylon is described. She made the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immoralities. The Legacy Standard Bible uses the word wrath for passion there. Made the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her immoralities. Uh, that's important because the same word is used of God's passion, which is rightly translated wrath in the next verses. 
The point is this, this woman representing the city and the hub of the empire has passion described as wine that she makes the nations drink. When you get drunk, you do bad things. The world will be intoxicated by her immoral, idolatrous ways. The nations will fall for the deception, a deception which appeals to the base desires of our sinfulness. It promises us that we can go ahead with sin and expect no consequence from God, or that we can go ahead with sin and whatever the consequence is from God, we'll just endure it. It'll be fine. The lie of Babylon is already in the hearts of men. It has been since Genesis. But in the last days, the whole world will give full expression to spiritual adultery. That imagery is profound. The Bible here talks about the sexual immoralities of Babylon. And throughout the Old Testament, sexual immorality was used as a metaphor for spiritual adultery. The forsaking of the one to whom you truly belong in exchange for other lovers. And no doubt the end times will be characterized by sexual immoralities that go along with the spiritual adultery. The metaphor is also literal. But don't make the mistake of thinking that uh, if you don't happen to participate in sexual immorality, but you've rejected God for other lovers, that you escape from what the Bible here calls a spiritual adultery, an idolatry, unfaithfulness to the one to whom humanity truly belongs. All of it is encompassed in this woman called Babylon. Babylon. This is a sold out, drunken prostitution to sin and misery and corruption and perversion. In fact, the world will engage in a last hour drunken orgy of rebellion against God. And listen, in our justice system today, are you legally responsible for the bad things you do when you are drunk? Of course you are. But what if you can't even remember where you were or what you did? you are still held responsible. Friends, if you are flirting with the world, you need to know where this flirtation ends. When does the dance stop? It ends with you fallen on the ground with the whore, drunk on her lies, exposed, guilty, and dead. Do not be deceived. Listen to the announcement of the third angel in verse 9. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. This third message is unbelievers warned Unbelievers warned. It, it is a warning for the unbelievers during the Great Tribulation. It is a warning for our hearts here this morning. And there is no more serious warning that you could ever hear. This is perhaps the most serious warning in all of the Bible. Let these words sink in. Torment forever and ever. Verse 9 is a challenge to the false prophet from chapter 13. False prophet said, if you take the mark of the beast, you'll be fine. Look at verse 9. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand. If you take the mark, you're dead. The false prophet said, if you take the mark, you get to live. God says, if you take the mark... You die twice. There is the second death coming. False prophet said, if you take the mark of the beast, you get protection, safety. You get to maintain your life and your lifestyle and your livelihood. You can continue in your godless living. You'll be protected in your life of immorality from any kind of divine intrusion, any kind of morality interruption. But the truth 
is that that mark will not protect you from God. It will only provoke God. To take the mark is to sell your soul to the devil, to permanently profess your loyalty to your own eternal destruction. All of this is a warning to not take the mark of the beast. A serious, sober warning in mid-heaven, don't take the mark. Don't worship the beast. Look at verse 10. He will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in the full strength of the cup of his rage. This is an if-then statement. The if is in verse 9. If you take the mark, if you worship the beast, the then is in verse 10. And it is a reversal of expectations. Back in verse 8, you, you drank the cup of the wine of the passion of her immoralities. You drink her wine, now drink God's wine. Romans 2.5 says, because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you store up against yourself wrath for the day of his wrath. To use the language and the metaphor of Revelation 14, you're filling the cup. You're filling the cup of wrath that you must drink if you drink down the wine of her immoralities. Wrath is vehement fury. Anger in this verse is settled indignation. This anger of God is not fickle, unpredictable, out of control, mindless rage. No, this is settled, controlled, just Good, divine response to sin. The angel says this is mixed in full strength. Quite literally, he says it is mixed, unmixed anger of God. It, it seems to not make sense. It's, it's an oxymoron. By mixed, he means prepared as when someone prepares a, a, a beverage, mixing liquids for the drink. But the word unmixed here means something like undiluted. Wine was often diluted with water. This is not diluted. That is, it is in its full strength. It has been prepared by God intentionally with the full strength of his wrath. Prepared for all whose crimes against God have not been covered. And he said this wrath is in the cup of his anger. That's a familiar picture in the Old Testament, a prominent theme. The word picture there portrays the idea of drinking down to the dregs the contents of whatever is in the cup. And what is in the cup for creatures who maintain rebellion against God is infinite fury. Tell me, how does one drain to the dregs a cup of infinite fury? How do you get to the bottom of its contents? only by drinking it forever. This is a really significant concept when we contemplate Jesus in the garden. Do you remember the scene? Matthew 26, 39. Jesus went a little beyond the disciples. He fell on his face and prayed saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. What was the cup that Jesus anticipated as he set his path toward the cross? It was the drinking to the dregs of the infinite fury of his father against all the sins of everyone who would ever believe. You and I can't possibly imagine what it was like for Jesus to be our sin bearer. To take that cup willingly in his love for you, to drink it to the dregs so that you could live. He would be the sin bearer for the many. And who but the infinite Son of God could bear the infinite contents of that cup? This is why no one can save but Jesus. There's no one else who qualifies. Only the infinite Son of God could drink infinite wrath down to the dregs and leave it so there is not a drop left of wrath for all who belong to him. How long will it take a finite being to pay for his own sins? Forever. 
Notice in verse 11. Forever and ever, the text says. It's the strongest way to say forever in the Greek text. I want you to notice something else in verse 10, and this is striking. Look at the second half. He will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Notice who's there. And we often think, and, 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 and this is right in some sense, that hell is the absence of God. Hell is being away from God. Hell is being away from Jesus. But it is not the absence of God that makes hell so awful primarily. The very presence of God in His omnipresence. He is everywhere all the time. Uh, there's never anywhere God isn't. God's very presence makes hell awful. And here that presence is represented even by the Lamb. Heaven's holy inhabitants approve this justice. And the Lamb's presence there should remove all doubt that hell is a myth made to scare kids. Or hell is a party with your friends. Or that hell is run by the devil. Satan is hell's first victim. Jesus said hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Not to run, but to be tormented day and night without rest. Hell is God's justice, and hell is enforced by God's presence. Jesus himself said it in Matthew 28, God is the one who destroys body and soul in hell. Turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. There is another angle on this. And by another angle, I, I do not mean at all a contradiction. But these two realities go together. There Paul is describing hell, conscious eternal torment. And in 2 Thessalonians 1.9, he says it this way. These who do not obey the gospel of Jesus will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and away from the glory of His might. Have you ever wondered how can it be possible for God to be away and present simultaneously? How can you have divine abandonment and divine visitation in the same moment? Think about the Garden of Eden. The flaming sword and the cherubim, God's manifest presence in the garden. And he tells Adam and Eve after they sinned, you must go away from him. Where he walked in the garden in the cool of the day with humanity. Well, did God not exist outside the garden? No, he was there too, but they had to go away. Think about it, what it meant for Jesus at the cross to experience simultaneously divine abandonment and divine visitation. He said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you abandoned, forsaken me? And yet Isaiah 53 says, it pleased the Father to crush him. The Father was present there, pouring out his wrath on his beloved Son. Similarly, hell will be doubly awful. Away from the enjoyment of the glorious presence and the beauty of God that humanity was designed for, but fell from, away from all of that. And present only with the goodness of God in its outburst against unrepentant sin. Hell will be doubly awful. The angel continues this fire and brimstone sermon in verse 11. He says, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. He says, the smoke of their torment goes up forever. Can't that just mean the smoke lasts a long time? You know, when a, a smart munitions hits an enemy compound, and then there's just a, a crater and rubble, and the smoke goes up for a while. Uh, they're not still getting hit by the missile, are they? Many evangelicals who have 
lost their stomach for the doctrine of conscious eternal torment. And let me just tell you, I don't have a stomach for it either. Have abandoned the clear revelation of God that the doctrine of conscious eternal torment is real and must be warned against. It is why Jesus came so that any who believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. You need to understand that the same words for eternity related to life are the same words used for eternity related to death, an eternal death. What do we do with this phrase? But, but it's just the smoke that goes up. Well, keep reading. They have no rest day and night. Revelation 20 verse 10 makes it clear there, a parallel passage says their torment is forever. Not just the manifest evidence of torment. Some have asked if hell is described as a destruction, how, how can people who have said to be destroyed keep going? That is exactly the point of hell. Hell is described as a destruction and a destruction that never ends, an eternal ruination of humanity. That does not cease. There have been temporary flashes of judgment before the end of the world. Experienced by earth dwellers throughout history. Sodom and Gomorrah. The worldwide flood in Genesis 11. But the judgment described here is not temporary. It will not be like the judgment of God against the earth for the 42 months of the great tribulation, nor the outpouring of his wrath in the seven years of the tribulation period as a whole. God will transition to a sustained, unrelenting torment around the clock with no end. Thomas Watson challenged us to think about eternity in relationship to the doctrine of hell. He gave an illustration describing a little bird coming from a distant solar system to pluck a fraction of a grain of sand in its beak and then flying away to that distant solar system and depositing that fraction of a grain of sand in that distant place and then flying back all those miles, all those light years to get another fragment of a grain of sand and taking it all the way back and depositing it. Thomas Watson says, when that little bird has taken every bit of sand off this planet, it, planet and created a new planet with all that sand, eternity will not have yet begun. And that illustration is woefully short of the reality. Have you thought about eternity, friends? When applied to the doctrine of hell, eternity means... That the unbeliever faces a wrath that he cannot resolve himself to endure. It is a loneliness you can't cope with. A blackness you can't get used to. A suffering you can't take a break from. Can't be distracted from. Cannot daydream during. Cannot tune out. Cannot medicate, inebriate, or ameliorate. It is a discomfort that you cannot ignore as you go about your business. Enduring the wrath of God will be your business. And there will be no person, no thing, no thought to console you in all of those endless ages. Your sentence will be to endure the unendurable, to bear the unbearable, to tolerate the intolerable, to be perpetually destroyed but never annihilated under the infinite weight of the glory of the justice and holiness of God. God in his mercy. In this, perhaps the sternest warning in all the Bible, is warning all of our hearts here today what is coming. That angel in the future, very publicly, for people who will be on the earth in that great tribulation, publishes this merciful warning. Don't take the mark. Don't worship the beast. But it is written for us in our Bibles so that we here today, this moment, can read it and hear it proclaimed. 
two roads diverge in the middle of your life. There is a broad, easy road that leads to conscious eternal torment. Everybody's on that road. Most walk that path. There is a narrow road that leads to life and few find it. Which path are you on? They're both before you right now, today. There's a fourth announcement in this text. It begins in verse 12. Saints preserved. All of this under the banner of good news. Saints preserved. Look at verse 12. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow with them. Perseverance of the saints. I, I've labeled this announcement saints preserved. That puts an emphasis on God's activity. God is preserving them. And here the text says this is the perseverance. That's the saints activity. I know we're looking at two sides of the same coin there, but you have to understand that saints persevering is God's means of preserving them. Do you understand the relationship? You hold on with a white knuckle grip by faith to the promises of God, and he's got you in his hand and no one can snatch you out. These things go together. Look at how their perseverance is described They keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. They keep on believing in the world's worst moments. Under duress, under persecution, under threat of death, they obey. They're following God. They do what he says. They they are loyal to him during the world's worst moments. When it's not just popular to disobey God and disbelieve the gospel, but mandated by global regulation to disobey God and disbelieve the gospel. No one will be tested more than tribulation saints. And there is therefore no greater proof that genuine faith lasts. Have you ever worried about the the mustard seed, half of a mustard seed faith that you've got going on in your own heart? Lord, will I make it? If the Holy Spirit has produced it, friend, you will make it. You might need to examine whether it's genuine faith. But believers make it to the end. And the the writer of Revelation draws attention to it. Here it is. Notice. Take a look. Here's the perseverance of the saints. Obedience, faith that doesn't stop. Loyalty under duress. Loyalty under threat of death. Look back at Revelation chapter 6. Back at the beginning of the tribulation. Back to the future. Looking backwards at what hasn't happened yet. To the opening scenes of the outpouring of God's wrath and the seal judgments. And the world is saying, rocks and mountains fall on us. We know God's angry. We know it's Jesus. But we'd rather die than repent. And the question at the end, great is the day of their wrath and who is able to stand? That's what the unbelieving world asks. But there's actually an answer to the question. Uh, look at verse 9 of chapter 7. A great multitude which no one could count from every nation and tribe and people and tongue standing. <laughs> They're able to stand. Where did they come from? John says, I don't know. The angel answers. They are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. What happens during the great tribulation? God finishes the great commission. Jesus said in Matthew 24, This gospel shall be preached to the ends of the earth, and then the end shall come. This fulfills it. Now the church during the church age should be about missions. We should have taken the gospel to every nation by now already. We haven't. 
God will finish. Verse 13. Wow. I heard a voice from heaven. <clears throat> wow. That's not what I sound like, is it? <coughs> Excuse me. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right. Did John put his pen down? Is he so astounded at what he's heard and seen that he has to be commanded? Keep writing, John. Is he amazed, terrified, encouraged? Look what he's commanded to write. Blessed are the dead. It's a beatitude. It's a statement of blessing. It's the second one in the book of Revelation. First one, blessed are all of you who read it and heed it. This is the second one. There are seven total in the book. The rest of them have to do with people here in the final hours of history. And he said they're blessed who die in the Lord from now on. That's interesting. We don't consider death a blessing except in an ultimate sense. We, we know Paul said to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. That's better by far. But Paul also said in Philippians 1, I know it's better for me to remain and be useful to you. This seems different. From now on is a temporal marker of a unique season of world history and a unique blessing for tribulation martyrs who die. And the sense of this blessing is simply this. If you're going to get killed with a sword, you're going to get killed with a sword. The sooner the better. <laughs> because that time is so bad, so awful. We just can't even calculate how awful that time will be. And so this blessing, why a blessing? Two reasons are given, rest and reward. Rest and reward. Because as soon as they die, they have rest from their labors. It's an amazing promise. You, you can imagine bedraggled, war-weary soldiers, starving, grimy after a desperate fight, finally arriving home. A hot meal and a warm shower and a return to loved ones. It's a home going. It's rest. The fight's over. Listen, it's far better to be dead as a martyr under the beast's momentary fury than to have the beast's momentary provision and run into God's eternal fury. Better dead than in bed with the beast. These tribulation martyrs will know it. You might be asking, wait a second, if there's a millennial kingdom populated by mortals, which the Bible's clear about, then, then, then there will be survivors, the 144,000 Jewish male evangelists as the seabed for a, a repentant nation of Israel. They're sealed unto survive, but, but you can't populate a new world with just males. So what, what about other survivors? Yes, it's clear there will be other survivors. And you might say, wouldn't it be great to survive? The writer of Revelation said, you're blessed if you die. It's not the only thing the Bible says. Here's Daniel 12, 12. Blessed is he who keeps waiting and reaches the 1,335 days. Daniel gives the opposite blessing. <laughs> blessed are the survivors too. 
who make it all the way through the great tribulation, all the way through the return of Christ, all the way through the renewal of the earth, which is past the 1260 days and the 1290 days, the, those extra 30 days in there probably are for the Matthew 25 sheep and goats judgment, uh, the assessment of everybody on the earth at the time. And he says, blessed are those who reach the 1,335. There's a massive cleanup program for the earth after scorched earth program. And the 1,335 initiates the glorious era of humanity. Maybe the Sabbath day of the week of millennia for humans. Where Jesus reigns on the earth. And they will beat their swords into plowshares. And there will be material prosperity and international righteousness under King Jesus forever. Blessed if you die as a martyr during the Great Tribulation. Blessed if you survive the Great Tribulation. But I think far better still if you believe the gospel now and belong to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this window into future world history. We need it. We need the warnings. We need the encouragements. We need the definition of perseverance. We need to think again seriously, soberly about the doctrine of conscious eternal torment. Oh Lord, we need to preach the gospel. Lord, there are some here this morning hearing my voice who need to believe the gospel. Would you be gracious today and give new life and a turn, a change of loyalties? Would you forgive all the sin? Would you make a new creature for your glory in Jesus' name? Amen.